Sometimes big ideas need to be put out there, and some concepts are so ridiculous that they challenge the way we look at things. This idea is one of them. I found this image a while ago and it got me thinking, why does it exist? There's no way it could be real, right? It'd be insane to make. And what would a nuclear bunker the size of a city look like anyway? So what's the story behind it, and how would you actually build it? My plan is to play with this hypothetical idea and remake it in 3D, to try and understand the structure from the gigantic vents, unique skyline, and its forgotten basements. And how the concept of building such a bunker is even more crazy than the idea itself, taking its roots in Soviet nuclear landscaping and firefighting. I also want to try and get into the headspace of people at the time coming to grips with this new reality of mutually assured destruction. This is the Nuke Proof City, and here's how I remade it. Now to get into this story, we need to go back to 1969, when Oscar Newman had his design published in Esquire magazine. This was just seven years after the Cuban Missile Crisis, an event that could have ended in nuclear disaster. And here's Oscar, just putting out ridiculous ideas like burying nukes under a city in order to build another city. I mean, this seems ridiculous, but his inspiration had its roots in some very real nuclear landscaping projects by the Soviets and the US, which I'll get into. But in the years leading up to the nuke-proof city idea, the US government had to deal with the elephant in the public's collective psyche, the threat of nuclear apocalypse. The atomic age was born. There is no denying that since that moment, the shadow of the atom bomb has been across all our lives. Meanwhile, good sense requires that all of us prepare for any eventuality. Now, as a government, you can't just say everything will be fine. What we all must learn to do. You. And you. And you. And you. Yep. And I guess you can. And that's the strategy they took. Look, everything will be okay. We put some food in some basements. Stay away from the blast, everything will be fine. Here's a bottle of coke and a packet of cigarettes while you wait. This thinking accumulated in up to 10,000 fallout shelters set up around the city with food, medical supplies, and radios. Although most of these shelters were repurposed spaces in schools, apartments, and offices, and wouldn't be able to withstand a nuclear attack, they were to act as refuge from radiation and fallout. Here's a map of the extent of nuclear fallout shelters built in New York. Although the vast majority has been decommissioned, as funds dried up as they became less relevant. Plaques can still be found outside some of these buildings today that were formerly used as shelters. Their plans to inform the public weren't just with catchy tunes and wholesome animations, but also with leaflets to inform and put worries at ease. Like this one that says, Radioactivity is not the bomb's great threat. In most atom raids, blasts and heat are by far the greatest danger that people must face. Radioactivity alone would only account for a small percentage of all human deaths and injuries except in underground or underwater explosions. I don't know why they threw in that end bit, but I think you get the idea. People had no practical solutions to a terrifying problem and would have to deal with it. And so to combat this, there was a campaign of a positive future brought on by the very thing that could bring our destruction, the atom. The atom, but the atom. The idea of flying cars and infinite energy. Magazines with amazing new inventions started to appear, like Popular Mechanics magazine, and later on shows like the Jetsons, all of this started with a speech from President Eisenhower in 1953 called Atoms for Peace, where he laid out a vision for a future world that uses atomic energy. To apply atomic energy to the needs of agriculture, medicine, and other peaceful activities. So now nuclear technology would no longer be the end of us, and instead would become our savior. And to be fair, the promise of nuclear power stations would have huge impact on energy production over the next few decades. And the hope for fusion technology seemed entirely possible with the rapid advancement of technology at the time. So why not push the boat out a little bit, right? What if we could put out fires and redirect rivers using nuclear bombs, said the Soviet generals. So that's what they did. This was a time period of nuclear experimentation. People wanted to know what was possible with their nuclear weapons. And boy did they try. In 1965, the USSR began its 23 year long journey called the Soviet Program for Peaceful Use of Nuclear Explosions. In one instance, which seemed to have directly inspired the Nuke Proof City, according to Oscar Newman's Esquire article, was when the Russians used a nuclear bomb to create a large reservoir for water storage slash overflow of a nearby river. At least, I'm assuming that's what he's referring to when he says that Russians in Uzbekistan used atomic energy to reshape the landscape in a grand way, creating rivers where none existed before. Of which, the end outcome of the USSR's project to use nuclear weapons for landscaping was not as rosy as it sounds, although it doesn't sound that rosy. It ended up in the creation of what was known as the Atomic Lake in Kazakhstan, made in 1965 using 140 kiloton underground 
nuclear explosion. The bomb hollowed out a 400 meter crater, which was filled in by the nearby river. The water in the lake became radioactive and is still radioactive to this day. Despite this, one of the ministers decided to swim in it to show how successful the project was. Another major nuclear experiment by the Soviets was their attempt to put out an ongoing fire with nuclear weapons. The fire had started in a natural gas well in Uzbekistan and carry on burning for three years, supposedly leaking enough gas to power many cities. Their plan was to dig a deep hole next to the gas well and place a bomb there. The resulting explosion would collapse the well and end the release of the gas stopping the fire. And it worked. Here's a quote I found from Interesting Engineering, taken from a Soviet newspaper. On that cold autumn day in 1966, an underground tremor of unprecedented force shook the ground, with a sparse grass cover on white sand. A dusty haze rose over the desert. The orange-coloured torch of the blazing well diminished, first slowly, then more rapidly, until it flickered and finally died out. For the first time in 1,064 days, quiet descended on the area. The jet-like roar of the gas well had been silenced. This wasn't the last natural gas fire put out by the Soviets, as they considered it a very effective use of the weapon, and continued its practice putting out their last fire in 1981. But before we all blame the Russians for arguably reckless use of nuclear weapons, and attempt to normalise it for the state, let's not forget the Americans didn't want to be outdone here, and set up Project Plowshare, where they too tested nuclear weapons to soften their perceived look by the public and find new ways of being economically useful, which, like the Russians, had adverse effects of radioactive dust clouds and water contamination. The United States is conducting, for the benefit of all nations, a program it calls Plowshare. The United States Atomic Energy Commission was already conducting the Atoms for Peace program to benefit the health and welfare of men everywhere. Developing, encouraging, and supervising the peaceful uses of nuclear radiation in science met the task that faces the Plowshare team is to explore and develop safe, efficient nuclear explosives. A nuclear blasted route across Central America could provide a navigable... So inspired by these nuclear experiments, Oscar's idea for the creation of the nuke-proof city was to hollow out a space below New York using these tried and tested nuclear landscaping experiments, using the blast to create a large cavity that could be reinforced with concrete. This idea has many obvious risks though, like destroying the city above it, and making a hole that would be completely radioactive and impossible to live in for a very long time. But putting that aside, I set to the task of making my own 3D version of the city. And after reading a few articles and playing about with a radius calculator on a map, I found that the city would have a radius of about 1.6 kilometers and a volume of 5 kilometers. Using this as a reference, I imported a map of New York with the correct scale. I then took the measurements I made and roughly built out the sphere. I then extruded the vents, made the skyline closer to 1969, and filled in the details. With that, I had my model of the city. I tried to follow Newman's poster as best I could, and even added a helicopter for scale. From this, I made a few animations to bring it to life, and make it feel less like a diagram, and more like a real place. Let's have a look at the city itself, taking it, if anything, a little too literally. Starting with New York. From the street, you would look up to 16 gigantic towers, which I don't think would look too out of place in a city already filled with skyscrapers. The towers are designed to pull in fresh air to the underground structure below. The city also had an access station, allowing people to commute down to the sub-city via a lift. Flying over it, you might notice the lack of natural light, which is something I only started to think about when I first began to model it. It's a city permanently at night, only illuminated by the buildings and streetlights, meaning it would be a lot of work to create a comfortable and natural living environment. This combined with the fact that all the vehicles would be petrol powered and who knows how many helicopters, I would imagine the place would become pretty awful if there was an issue with these towers. Say, maybe a nuclear attack? Now looking back at Oscar Newman's poster, you can see that the city is a circular grid shape and devoid of parks. So that's the approach I took when reconstructing it. I kept the circular shape and gave random heights to the buildings, just like in the poster. Then moving below the city, here we'd have some kind of network of pipes and generators housed in gigantic corridors. My take on this is a smaller passageway that would open up to pipes the size of buildings. So here's how it would look. Opening a sealed door, you'd enter one of these vast corridors, extending into the distance. I used a few hydroelectric dams as reference. Lastly, I also wanted to feel what it might be like living in a small apartment in the city. So looking at images of the ideal luxury life of an upmarket nuclear bunker as a reference, I started to build my own little shelter and used what models I had to hand. Now, practically speaking, this idea was never going to happen. And Oscar Newman made the design as a joke. It points to the absurdity of the nuclear age. 
that we'd rather live in a bubble underground than figure out how not to kill each other. And I think that's what this idea is about. It's a piece of fiction that allows us to take a step back and look at the absurd, giving us a playground to say what if, and then seeing that what if is a terrible idea. Thanks. Down below the city streets, city streets. Where the hustle never meets. Never meets. We built a world that's safe and bright. Safe and bright. In our cozy new crusade. Welcome to the new crusade. Every room with modern play, it's the future.